This is Thank You Mama, weekly lessons for mothers all over the world. Hi, and welcome to Thank You Mama. My name is Anna Tider, and my guest today is Rupa Chavla. Hi, Rupa. Hi, yeah. Hi. From Vienna. From Vienna, <laughs> Austria. But, yes. Ru- Rupa, you are half Burmese and half Indian, and you've lived in Vienna for past 40 years. Yes. Because you have worked, I, I believe, your whole life for United Nations. Yes, practically for my whole life, yes. <laughs> I think that that's the job I started off with and I ended off with. So, uh, yes, I stayed with the United Nations. Uh, I, I was in Delhi in, in India. I worked with the United Nations for some years and then I took a break and then I happened to come to Vienna for a holiday and in 1981 and uh, I started working with the UN since then. And you got stuck, like many people do. We come to Vienna yes. and we just get stuck there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we use we use it as a holiday place to come to and then we land up working here. <laughs> and Rupa, I, I think it's interesting. Many people don't know that Vienna is one of the four headquarters of United Nations in the world. And there are around 6,000 people working for United Nations and other international organizations with their headquarters in Vienna. Yes, actually, in the uh, the Vienna International Center itself, we're about, I think, uh, there are about 5,000 people working there. Which is a lot when you think about the fact that yes. there are 2 million people living in Vienna. It's a huge amount of people in Vienna do work for international organizations, which is fun. <laughs> yeah, well, it says a lot for Vienna. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> Rupa, so now you're retired and you are a proud mm-hmm. mama of two beautiful people children and i can yes. say i think i can say i even more proud grandma of two yes i'm a absolutely doting grandparent <laughs> and uh, my two little grandchildren uh, seven and two a boy and a girl i absolutely adore them and find as much time as i can to spend with them which i'm lucky that my daughter makes uh, makes it possible for us to spend a lot of time with them. Yeah, because they live in London, so so it's... They live in London, yes. It's not as easy. You have to make it possible. <laughs> yes, yes, <Yeah. laughs> that's true. Rupa, let's talk about Mama. Your Mama is such an amazing person, and I am a friend of your children, and I've always known your Mama and about your Mama, and I was always fascinated what a huge figure she is in your family and how admired and adored she is. And I would even say she's some kind of a saint of your family. You know, she's so present with such a beautiful, beautiful aura around her. Yes, actually, uh, Mummy is, I think, uh, as we have been getting older, we have been admiring, learning to appreciate my mother more and more. And I don't think she would see herself as a saint or anything like that, or she doesn't even realize what a big presence she is in our in our lives. But... uh, I think uh, one thing I do know is that she, she, her blessings are always with us, and we are very blessed to have a mother like her. What is her name, Rupa? Please help me because I tried spelling it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the th- uh, her name is actually the Burmese name is Mamio Mint, but she she went to in Burma when she was growing up. Uh, she went to school uh, where there were nuns, Irish nuns. So she she grew up learning English. And since the nuns couldn't pronounce any of the Burmese names, they just um, decided to give all the students, the Burmese student names they could pronounce or English names. And my mother uh, was called Ada and her sister is Emma. So Mummy has been known as Ada by is known as Ada by everybody. Mama Ada was very or is still very, very beautiful. She was Miss Burma nineteen forty eight. Yeah, yeah, in nineteen forty eight she was Miss Burma. And actually uh, one wonders why uh, how come there were any Miss Anything because uh, all this whole Miss culture of world and miss uh, some country or miss whatever that started very much much later on 
I think in the 60s or something, if I'm not mistaken. But, but uh, at that time, the the king's grandson, I think, of in Burma, he decided that he wanted the young people of Burma to be healthy. And so he started opening up gyms all over Burma and uh, where young people would go and work out for, for health reasons, you know, to be strong and healthy. And then he decided to have a competition. And I think this uh, this thing was done all over Southeast Asia. I, I think Thailand also had a Miss Thailand at the same time that Mummy was Miss Burma. And Mummy, well, she, she entered one of these competitions and she, she was crowned Miss Burma in 1948. And uh, actually, that uh, just before that, she met my father, who was uh, in the Indian Army, and he was uh, an engineer. So he was in Burma during the war, Second World War, building uh, bridges as mm-hmm. an engineer. Mm-hmm. And uh, he he met my mother there. Uh, it was it was quite romantic the way they met actually because uh, uh, Daddy was uh, with all the young army officers. Um, they had a night in the town and they were driving and they were quite. Uh, I think they had had quite a bit to drink. So their jeep actually came around a curve and toppled over. It happened to be. It happened to have toppled over in front of my mother's house. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> my grandfather. It happened to topple over in in front of Miss Burma's house. <laughs> Lucky guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and my grandfather was in the police. He sort of rushed out and decided uh, to help all these young uh, officers and took them into hospital and things like that. And my father, he had quite a bad leg injury, so he had to be in hospital for quite a long time. And my grandfather very kindly used to go and visit them. He said, these poor young men, they're here without any family, so we should go and see them in hospital. So he would take one of his two daughters with them, him, you know, to accompany him. And, uh, well, that's how Daddy met Mummy. And, uh, well, the the rest is history. <laughs> Amazing. She was very young, you told me, when she was, she got married she at was. 17. She was, I think she was about 15 or 16 when she met him. And then, uh, then she got, uh, she was married when she was 17. And um, I was born when she was 18. And and her life, we talked about, you told me how it wasn't easy for her because she had to move to India to his family. Of course, she had to move to India. In fact, um, uh, she moved to India. And in the beginning, uh, she, uh, she she said, no, I, my father was there, you know, wanting to marry her. And he said, she kept saying, no, 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 she didn't want to marry him because she said, I don't know about these Indian men. They probably have another wife out there and all sorts of things. So how do I know? So um, actually, I think my grandparents were very forward-thinking people at that time, or the Burmese are that way, uh, very sort of, uh, I, I, I will, you know, the Burmese are more open, I think, compared to the traditional Indian ways. And uh, so my my mother said, I'll come to India only if my, my mother can come with me, and I will check and she and I will check out and see that there is everything is okay with you. And my grandmother actually came to Burma with my mom, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, to see that to, to check out my father to see he was all right. How clever was that? Yeah. So then, uh, then mummy agreed to marry my dad, and and then my mother, uh, my grandmother went back. And uh, yes, it was not easy because my father came from a very traditional, a large traditional. Uh, a South Indian family. He had uh, he had eight uh, siblings, so they were a family. You know, nine brothers and sisters all together. And my gra- it took some time for my grandparents to accept uh, my mum. And they didn't speak the same language. No, they didn't speak the same language. Uh, my grandfather spoke English, and all my father's uh, sisters and brothers spoke English. You know, when they were together, they would speak only in Telugu, and uh, mummy would uh, be there. I suppose daddy translated for her or whatever. I have to. I, I have never really thought about uh, how it was for her. I have to ask her about this. <laughs> but it wasn't simple. No, 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 no. So my mother made, took the trouble to actually actually learn Hindi. She actually had a teacher. She learned how to read and write Hindi to a certain extent. Uh, she she could read Hindi, which my father couldn't do. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so because she had to communicate with the staff in the house. That time you had a lot of staff and there was no other way she could do it except, uh, you know, learn Hindi. And as far as talking to each other at home, we all we spoke English. I mean, that, that was uh, the common language that we spoke between. My parents spoke to each other and we spoke with them. And she had three children. We didn't say that yet. Yes, uh, I am the oldest of three kids and I've got two brothers. Yes. In fact, um, I, I, I was asking mommy about uh, talking about how difficult it must have been. I mean, she wished when she was uh, she went into labor with me. My father was out on a duty trip. So she was all alone. Actually, all the young officers had to go out on this duty trip and all their wives were put in a, in uh, the army barracks. And as luck would have it, he told this family, one army family and said, look, she's pregnant. I don't know when the baby's coming. I mean, will you take care of her and everything? And two days before she, or two or a week before she went into labor, this family had gone on a holiday and they got caught in some kind of a flood and the whole family got wiped out. So I said, what would you do then? She said, well, somehow, she said, the other wives and everybody, they all took care of us. Uh, they knew I was, you know, I was young. and But it couldn't have been easy. She must have been so scared. And I said, now when you think about it, I said, you don't, don't feel scared. She said, no, now I can laugh and talk about it. But it was, it was very frightening at that time. She's now 88 and she lives with my brother in Delhi, in New Delhi, in India. And uh, she's very active. You told me you told me not only that is she not a burden, she even helps out. Oh, yes, she helps. Uh, definitely. She, so sometimes uh, when they, they feel like eating something specially cooked by mommy or they're having guests, they will say, you know, mama, you know, can you come down and help us? And she will. She's very happy to cook it, and she makes all the jams and the pickles for the uh, the house. We talked about her recipe for staying young. You told me she gets up at five a.m. every morning. Yeah, that she she gets up at five, and she she does. Uh, you know, she does a lot of meditation. She meditates a lot, mm-hmm. and so she meditates for an hour in the morning. She's Buddhist. Yeah, yeah, she's Bud- she's Buddhist. Yes, and uh, she then goes up and she has this thing of feeding the birds, and so um, where my brother lives, there are a lot of uh, peacocks. Mm-hmm. So all the peacocks and the crows and the parrots and it's sort of slightly outside of uh, the city. So you know it's but there's a lot a lot of farms around there. So they have a lot of these uh, birds which come out and uh, they wait for her. Actually, they tap on the window asking for their morning food. She's like a Burmese Snow White <laughs> yeah, yeah, feeding really. the birds. <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then she exercises. Then she does her yoga exercises. As far as I can recall, my mother has always done exercises. I think this came from the training of when she was Miss Burma, where she had got u- gotten used to keeping her body in shape. So ever ever since I can remember, even as, an, as a child, wherever we were, uh, she just needed a little space and she would do her exercises. And now she is along the way, she has been adapting it, you know. Now she can't do some of the complicated uh, movements in yoga, but she she still uh, she d- still manages to put her legs up and uh, do a cycle them up in the air and uh, lift uh, her lift uh, her legs up and down, you know, with the tummy using her abs yeah. and things like that. <laughs> you told me she did shoulder stands until she was 75, which is amazing. Yes, yes, exactly. When at some stage she was li- living alone and it worried us, all three of us. We said, for God's sake, please stop doing <laughs> these things because if anything happens to you, there's nobody there. And then she goes for walks. Actually, after her exercises, she goes for, a, she has her breakfast and then she goes, or, or maybe she goes for a walk first and then comes back and has her breakfast. She's very, very disciplined. I mean, as far as a breakfast goes, there's a certain amount she eats and that's it, you know, and uh, her lunch has to be at a certain time, her dinner is at a certain time. And uh, she's uh, in that she's very disciplined and she's very particular about how much she eats. 
um, yeah, she's uh, she's quite amazing. And when when she goes for her walks, of course, she's 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 uh, all all you know. She takes biscuits for the stray dogs and sweeties for the village kids. So everybody know her there. You know, they greet her. They all come up. To her when they have colds or the stomach ache, they come up to her and ask her, uh, you know, Grandma, what, what, I've got a cold, what should I do? And she'll hand out some natural therapy thing, you know, which she'll give them. And some dear say, Grandma, you know, my husband is so difficult. She'll become like the bi- <laughs> <laughs> village counselor. <laughs> <That's cute. laughs> She's a she's amazing. I mean, she's she's really she she and she and she really believes in uh, and her meditation is so strong that she actually is able to heal herself. And I've seen that. That's amazing. She meditates twice a day. You said twice a day. Yeah, in the morning and in the evening at sunset. But she she really when she has aches and pains, I remember always as children she would you know put her hands on us and you know give us energy. But she heals herself. And that's for the reason why whenever I call her, I've never heard her complain. She always says, I'm well. I say, how are you? I'm fine. I'm always fine. That's her uh, <laughs> litany. It's always, I'm fine. I'm always fine. Which is amazing, you know, because usually you, you dread calling your mother to because you think, oh, my God, she's going to give me a, the, you know, I'm, this is aching and that is aching. Not with my mom. Not at all. Let's go to the lessons, things you've learned from her. And the first thing you mentioned was honesty. I found that very fascinating. And you said the honesty you've learned, you've learned from your father. And she is much. she has a much better art of honesty. Tell us about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think <laughs> I, I won't say I learned it from my father. I think it, I learned it from both of them. It was just they both had such different ways. My father was uh, being in the army. He was a disciplinarian. He was, uh, you know, he, he wanted everything his way. And uh, he could not stand it if anybody lied or, or even sweetened a lie. It, for him, it was black was black and white was white and there were no shades of gray. So uh, um, he, it came out very often. His honesty was uh, so uh, sort of so honest so to, <laughs> within quotes was that it sometimes hurt people. Yeah, he could be uh, quite rough with his uh, honesty. Whereas uh, my mom is also very is an honest person. But she is very diplomatic and very um, unimposing in the way she is. Uh, she is gentle with people. If she, if she is, uh, she, you know, she doesn't want to answer a question which may need her to, you know, make up something. She just smiles. Or if she's angry, she will uh, keep it. She will smile, and or she will just walk away, and then she will tell you uh, the truth so that it won't hurt you. And that I think is uh, it's it's a wonderful way to be, and uh, because it avoided so many conflicts. And I think, in a way, uh, we got along so well with my mom, or we wanted to uh, uh, share with her so much, because even if she had to say something unpleasant, uh, she would do it in a very um, gentle way. I tend to have my father's temperament. So sometimes <laughs> it comes out, <laughs> you know, it all comes out. But uh, I'm learning now with age more and more. I sit back and I say, what would, how would mommy handle this? And uh, it gets better every time, I must say. It works. I think it's one of the best traits and most important lessons to learn and I am very much like you I'm totally blunt and unfortunately sometimes hurt people with that and I so wish I could learn what your mama knows how to be honest but in a constructive and gentle ways yeah exactly to avoid conflict but we talked about this when you mentioned that you started learning it do you think people learn it with age in general i think uh, it has to be worked at uh, first of all it's realizing that you are being blunt or you are being hurtful to somebody i most, a lot of people are in denial 
about it. They said, well, that's me. So accept it or lump it or whatever. And then wanting to do something about it, especially when you have such a strong, at least with me, I have such a strong forebuild in front of me. Mm-hmm. You want to be like that. Yeah. And then you try, then you work at it. Mm-hmm. And actually, in, to, in today's world, there is so much literature, so much reading, so many books. I think for people to say that they're in denial would be a difficult thing. It's just that they just don't accept how they are. That's all. And but it's very, it's it's hard. Working yourself is hard, and you have to be critical enough towards yourself. Yeah. And then exactly yes. something like this, you really have to have patience with yourself and work at it for a while until you become more like your mommy. <laughs> but I, I definitely think it gets easier. It gets, I, mm-hmm. I find that, uh, that I have mellowed a lot. Well, my husband tells me that too. <laughs> <laughs> so there must be something to it. <laughs> but I'll tell you a funny story with my mother about one of her the honesties because uh, she's very proud of, you know, ne- not that, never telling t- lies and never stealing any money. When she was young and my father were, was a young officer, uh, the, the army, their, their, their salaries were not very high. So uh, he used to give her a certain amount of money for her housekeeping. And she would manage the house in that housekeeping without any frills or extras. So uh, my brother wanted a tricycle because his friends all had tricycles and he was crying and said, I want a tricycle. And she said, now where the hell do I get a tricycle for this child? How can I buy it? I don't have any money. I don't want to ask my husband. So she actually took money out of the housekeeping without telling my father. And it was something like 28 rupees, you know, which is, I don't know what it was. In today's money, it's a few cents. And she never told him. And then my father died. And she said, the funny thing is, I never remembered this. And then after your father died, I remembered, uh, I was just lying there one day and I remembered this, um, you know, incident. So she said, I took that 28 rupees and I went and put it in front of his picture Mm -hmm. and said, this is just to tell you I'm returning what I took from you without telling you. I'm very sorry I had to do it. But <laughs> <laughs> she says, so if you're wherever you are, just be assured this is your money returned. <laughs> I love it. So even after a person after a person is dead, she pays her debt. <laughs> Rupa, you told me another wonderful story, which was about another very big lesson, a lesson about weakness and strength and what is being weak and what is being strong. My father, as I said, was uh, quite a a disciplinarian and he wanted everything just so. And mummy was was an easygoing person. She was very Burmese in her attitude. You know, the the house was in a bit of a mess. Who cared? In fact, she says herself, she says, actually, I think I'm a very lazy person. (laughs) But (laughs) disciplined, but lazy. I can identify um, with that. <laughs> okay. So she was, my father was doing his usual grumbling act. I don't know what he was complaining about. He was muttering up and down. And I think when he retired, he didn't uh, have anything to do. So he spent a lot of his time just finding faults. And I had gone there on holiday from Vienna and uh, he, he was just raving and ranting about something. And mummy was busy in the kitchen cooking. She was uh, um, cleaning rice for people who don't know about cleaning rice. So in India, the rice uh, tends to be mixed with little white stones so that uh, it increases the weight of rice. So it every time you cook rice, you have to make sure. And uh, in those days, rice came open. You just, you know, people just sold it uh, by the kilo, not like all si- um, sealed like now when quality control, there wasn't any of it. So uh, every time you cooked rice, it had to be cleaned by hand. Mummy was there cleaning this rice, taking out one little stone after the other. And uh, so I just turned around to her and I said, you know, listening to my father going on. And I said, Mom, how can you put up with this? I mean, this is so ridiculous. Why do you keep quiet? Why do you put up with this? Why don't you just quit? Your children are all grown up. You can walk out anytime. I find it so weak. And uh, so she just, uh, she looked up. She sort of stopped cleaning the rice and she looked up at me and she said, Rupa, actually, 
at this moment, what I am doing is I'm cleaning rice. And that is the most important thing to me. I am not listening to what he's saying. I'm concentrated totally in the moment, the Zen moment. She was having a Zen moment in cleaning rice. And then she said, as for being weak, I think I'm strong for putting up with it. And I think you are weak for having, I I was divorced, and you are weak for uh, having walked out of something. She says, it's all perspective, which was, it made me stop and think. And it was a lesson I learned was that what person may con- one person may consider a strength, somebody else considers it a weakness. And so from there it follows that one has to stop judging. One has to be, be non-judgmental, why people do things and how they do it. It is all, uh, it's individual. Yeah, and the question of perspective. I- totally a question of perspective. This is a big lesson I learned from my mom, to stop and before judging immediately think why (laughs) i live in um, vienna and sometimes when i first came here i was not very sure why the people here seem to be angry all the time now i just when they are i just walk past and say well they've probably got their own problems you know Mm -hmm. everybody has their own problems Mm -hmm. and everybody's dealing with it in their own way and uh, usually if you say good morning you get a reply if I go around with a long face, well, I get a long face back. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's yeah. also you can change it around too, which is nice. Yeah. And we have a, a third beautiful and important lesson from her. You told me about how she's self-contained. And it took me a while to understand what you were talking about. Well, the self-contained, in, the, the, this is uh, like a person who is uh, happy in herself. She doesn't doesn't need anything from outside to make her happy. She is at peace with herself. She doesn't need crutches uh, of friends. She has lots of friends because of the way she is. Everybody wanted to come and stay with them. She's now going on a trip to South India, to Bangalore, because some young friend's daughter's getting married. Then she's going uh, to for to spend Christmas with her grandchildren in Pune because they want her to be there for Christmas. So she's always, uh, she's always, it's because I think she's not needy. And she doesn't constantly, and even with me, with the children, she's never, she doesn't say why, if I don't call her for a month, she will never say, why didn't, why haven't you called me? You know, she will be happy to hear from me. Or if I call her every day, and if I call her every day, she's happy to hear from me every day. But I've never heard her say, oh, I haven't spoken to you for so long. Why were we too busy? Which I tend to do with my children, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I'm working on that one. <laughs> yes, that that definitely needs some work with me. It's such a huge lesson to be self-contained and to be your own source of happiness, not to need anything from anything or anybody from the outside to be happy. It's it's a huge one. Yes, it is really. And uh, she's uh, grateful. She's so thankful, you know, for everything. Uh, she's uh, gratitude plays a plays a big part in her life. And I have been reading a lot of these books uh, about, you know, law of attraction, gratitude, this and that. But this, my mother had never read any of this. This all came to her. Do you think it came through her meditation and her spiritual yes, practice? I'm sure it came. Not only through meditation and spiritual practice, but I think also from her ancestors, from her parents, mm-hmm. from her grandparents. Mm-hmm. It was the way she was brought up, which is be helpful where you can. Pray for some. If you cannot be helpful, then bless the person and, you know, pray for them. And she gives time. She has time for people always. Uh, my mom's always had time for people even when we were young I mean Mm -hmm. uh, in today's world I see young mothers stressed running around because there is somehow the world has become such a stressy place my mother uh, I don't know she had time I always remember her she would have her afternoon nap at four o'clock she would get up, she would get all dressed and wait for my father to come home. And then they would have evening tea together. And, you know, she would be all dressed 
and looking lovely. I mean, something I think a man looked forward to come home to. Well, of course, she was not working. She uh, she she was not. Uh, 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 I'm talking about the 50s and the 60s. I mean, uh, women in India. There were very few working women in India at that time. In any case, and uh, I think uh, very few wives in the army worked. But uh, yeah, Rupa. Another one I want to mention is how she doesn't remember bad times. That I, that I want to learn as well. We talked about being positive and seeing your life from a positive light. And for me personally, learning to positively narrate, narrate your life, which I haven't learned from my parents. Our or their narration of life was always in the negative light, light of the bad things that happen. I want to learn learn the positive way. Yeah, this, this also, I think... Um, Probably it came to her naturally, the way she was. And I asked her why she hadn't told me some stories. And she said, uh, what what would it uh, bring from telling you those stories in any case? And I think what I'm finding now is uh, that uh, when I talk about nice things, nice stories, it improves the mood. You talk about bad things and then you just it's it's a role you know then you keep if one bad one bad incident and then you start thinking about the next one and the next one next one and the same thing if you think of a good incident and then you find a funnier one and a funnier one and nicer one so one has to maybe make a very conscious effort towards that of holding on to the good ones mm -hmm. and uh, uh, mummy definitely um, held on to the good ones and it was not easy i mean uh, the japanese were in burma and uh, her father was in the police and they were being transferred from one place to the other i think there was a lot of shortage and everything and but my grandparents uh, ran a open house i mean anybody anybody on if was in need of anything mummy said at times there were 10 15 people living in their house because uh, my my grandfather and grandmother would be feeding all of them and they would be you know one big happy family because some people couldn't afford it so she grew up in a very happy uh, welcoming warm loving atmosphere and i think uh, a lot of that says a lot of it reflects in her person as a being rupa i want to to come to the to our last point which was what was she not able to teach you this is I, I i try to think about what she did not teach me but at the same time i think sometimes you can also learn from a from a negative negative experience what what happened was my father being my father was much older than my mother so basically it was my mother and my father saw my mother as one of the children. So there were like four kids and my father. Mm -hmm. So um, he tended to disregard her. I mean, she was very beautiful. She was, he treated her like a little princess. He treated her like a doll. I mean, he did everything for her. But he disregarded her as thinking person. And I think uh, that uh, then also, and which she somehow being, I suppose, uh, coming there at such a young age, she just accepted it and fell into that role. He would not discuss politics with her. He would not discuss his office with her. He would not. In, in fact, as I grew up, he would discuss more with me than he he would talk to mummy about these things. And so I, I to a certain extent, that got reflected in me uh, in my self-confidence of putting myself forward. I was like backward and being forward. And I think that uh, that reflected in my uh, in my career. But the other side of the coin was that because I felt so resentful of my mother being put down, I took the aggressive way to assert myself as a woman. So I don't know. You know, I, I would say that uh, because that mummy, mummy took it all very quietly, so it made me uh, less confident. Uh, but at the same time, it maybe made me confident, but uh, I don't know, in a different way. <laughs> I don't know, Rupa. When I hear you talk now, when I hear you talk now, you know, you sound amazing. <laughs> you sound very confident <laughs> and eloquent and fantastic. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, all I can say is my mother, uh, we had staff in the house. My mother did not teach me how to cook or she... Uh, she did not 
teach me how to clean the house or like lots of, you know, lots of things which uh, people do. She's, my mother sewed very well, but she never taught me to sew. She knitted. She never taught me how to knit. But what I take uh, take away from my mother, uh, what all the things I've said, and uh, most of all is to be generous with kindness and, and to be understanding and uh, not to try and change anybody, accept and love them as they are. And that, I think, is one of the biggest uh, messages I've got or taken, I take away from my mother. Rupa, thank you so much. These were amazing lessons. Thank you so much for sharing them with me. You're welcome. And please, please send your mama my love and tell her thank I you. I will. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. I will tell her. I'll talk to her tomorrow, and I'll tell her all about it. And now, actually, you have uh, made me interested in uh, finding out so much more. So I thank you for doing this this topic and asking me to talk because it's made me think of uh, because I need to know much more, and I never really. I think to a certain extent, I just took a lot for granted, and so. Uh, yeah, this is opening up, uh, at least for my, I think my mother and me, a whole new chapter. So uh, thank you. I'm so happy, Rupa. <laughs> thank you so much. And I think I really believe this is happening with most of the women I'm interviewing. And it's opening it's opening up more love towards our mamas and, and gratitude. And it's it makes me so happy. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Anna. My guest today was Rupa Chavla from Vienna, Austria, originally from India. From Rupa's Burmese mama, Ada, we learn to be honest, but in a gentle way, not to judge, because things are always relative. To be self-contained, meaning to be our own source of happiness. To be grateful, to meditate, and to exercise daily. If you have a mama you'd like to share, you could get in touch with me at info at thankyoumama.net. You can also find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter under Anna Tider. That's T-A-J-D-E-R. This was Thank You Mama. Come back next week, subscribe, and tell your friends. <laughs>